All right, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. There's a lot of uh, energy in the room this morning. Glad to see everybody here. We have a few uh, new faces, so uh, we welcome them to the study. Uh, for their benefit, this is uh, the fourth fourth year of what's turned out to be a four-year uh, study on uh, church history from the point of view of um, uh, the grace history as far as uh, mid ex Pauline dispensationalism is concerned. And if you don't know what that means, well, hopefully we'll be able to explain that to you. But uh, last Sunday we resumed class for this term. So this is the beginning of the fourth term. And we did so by looking at... Uh, uh, C.R. Stam, the first publication of the Brian Searchlight. We surveyed the first 12 issues. We identified the fact that Stam, from the very beginning, was a uh, was teaching a mid ex dispensational point of view. And I just want to kind of refresh your memory about a couple things before we move on to today's topic, which is the formation of the Grace Gospel Fellowship of the GGF. We've seen in, in the third term or the last term that between July 1937 and April 1938. O'Hare states that the church, uh, the church began before Paul wrote the book of Romans. And we identified that as the first articulation of a clear mid-Acts position. And he writes that in a book um, entitled uh, God's Reign of Grace for the Human Race that falls between the end of Bible study for Bereans in July 1937 but before the publication of the dispensational razzle-dazzle in, in uh, April 1938. Then we saw at the end of last term that in January 1939, the Worldwide Grace Testimony Mission was founded. We saw last week that in uh, April 1940, I might have that wrong, it might be March, I can't, I'm going off the top of my head, but in the spring of 1940, Stan publishes the first edition of the Brain Searchlight, which is still being published to this day. Obviously Stan has since passed away, but that, that ministry has been continued on. And then we also saw that in 1943, Stan becomes a traveling representative of the Worldwide Grace Testimony, among other things. Okay? So this morning, if you look at your notes that you have in front of you, this is Lesson 108, the founding of the Grace Gospel Fellowship, and there's a couple points of introduction and review that I'd like to talk about. So in Lesson 106, we saw, that we saw the formation of the Worldwide Grace Testimony in 1939, and we identified that that was the first attempt to or, uh, organization within the Grace Movement. And I got that up here, noted in January 1939, that's the first attempt. In Lesson 107, we reported that in 1943, J.C. O'Hare approached C.R. Stam about becoming a traveling representative of the Worldwide Grace Testimony. That's this point right here. So, by 1944, some within the Grace Movement were calling for more organized fellowship amongst grace believers in the United States. These events ultimately led to the formation of the Grace Gospel Fellowship. Now I want to stop there for a minute. I want to point out and remind you that according to Stam's memoirs, the reason why he was approached by Pastor O'Hare to be a traveling rep of the Worldwide Grace Testimony is to promote a wider fellowship amongst people that were believing these doctrines. Okay? So by 1944, there's going to emerge a real, shall we say, urge amongst some of these believers for some sort of more formal, uh, organized fellowship. So if you look at the next point, in July 1947, 1974, Ray and it's Reich or it's Rich. 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 Ray Rich. Thanks. Uh, the longtime librarian at Grace Bible College published an essay titled Our Grace Heritage in a special edition of Truth Magazine, the official periodical of the Grace Gospel Fellowship. In this article, Rich, Rich recounts the events that led to the founding of the GGF. Quote, By the middle of the 1930s, there were numerous churches and independent Bible classes across the country preaching and teaching the Grace message. That's a key point. Notice what the state of affairs is in the mid-30s. Numerous churches and independent Bible classes across the country preaching and teaching the grace message. There are literally churches scattered all over. There's churches in Muskegon, Chicago, all over where there are, where there are men, uh, preachers in pulpits within, in local churches and congregations 
that are seeing these things and are teaching them uh, to the degree that they understand them throughout the 30s. As noted earlier, Bible conferences and the advent of radio provided media for the dissemination of the truth concerning the dispensation of the mystery. At the outset, there was little outward unity or pooling of efforts to do a more effective job. The first step of unification came through Bible conferences in the Midwest, where people from many locations were brought together to share their mutual blessings. The second step was the organization of the Worldwide Grace Testimony. This, how, uh, this mis the mission, sorry, this, however, was in reality a self-perpetuating mission board. The mission board did conduct a Bible conference, which benefited the constituency, but the pastors who were not on this board felt a lack. There was a need for a fellowship organization of the pastors. So understand what's going on here, okay? As this thing is, as as these as more people are coming to understand these things, and as there's pastors and pulpits and independent churches spread throughout the country, there's beginning to be a voiced desire for there to be some sort of more formalized fellowship amongst the pastors, okay? Uh, so before we leave this, does anybody have any questions about that? This is, in my opinion, as, as when we get to the end, I'll explain to you why I think all this is, is important. But Mike, it looked like you had a yeah, question. I don't want to get you off track on what, where we're going with this, but I, I, I noticed in the Worldwide Grace Testimony Resolution Letter written by Dr. by Mr. Baker, he already takes a, a, a mid-Acts or Acts 13 stand on the beginning of the church, and he says so very plainly there. Is that significant or or not? Or um, that so that would be that's dated 1944, right? Um, At the top of it, the handout. You gave yeah, what's the date on the top of that? Is it? Uh, four, yeah, May 16, 1944. Uh, yeah, I think that is. I think that Baker definitely was of that opinion. Now, whether or not the mission was officially there, I'm not certain. How do you think Mr. Stam would have felt about that? Uh, he's he was the traveling representative. Yeah, I think that these guys always had discussions about these things, but in the end, I don't think they viewed their slight differences on where the church began as anything that was of major consequence between them. So. What the state in the 30s is you have independent Bible churches all throughout the country with ministers in them that are coming to understand some of these things. So 1939, you have the formation of the Worldwide Grace Testimony. This is the first formalized attempt at organization. Before this, you have something similar to what we're going to do here next month. You have a, 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 a church would host a Bible conference. They would invite maybe some different speakers in and people would come and they'd have a meeting and a weekend or a week or however long it was and they would be preaching and teaching and singing and fellowship and so forth and then when it was over everybody would go back to their you know respective church or what have you what's different about 1939 now is we're starting to have organization at a level beyond the local church okay and what we're going to start to see with the formation of the ggf is that type of structure so if you look at the next point on page one, the, for, the formation of the Grace Gospel Fellowship. According to Ray, his father, Pastor Herman Rich, was one who especially felt that an organized fellowship of pastors was needed. Ray reports that it was at a conference of pastors and missionaries at First Church of the Fundamentals in Evansville, Indiana, in September, from September 11 uh, through 13, 1944, that his father, Herman, first proposed the formation of an organized fellowship, okay? So, you're talking September now, September 1944, where, I'm just going to say it like this, the GGF is, is uh, first proposed. What would, be, what would become the GGF was first proposed. And that's at this Bible conference that's in Evansville, Indiana, the week, that weekend of uh, September 11th through the 13th, 1944. And the proposal to do it is coming from Herman Rich, uh, Ray Rich's father. Records indicate that the following men were present at this meeting. Charles Baker, Harry Baltima, Carl Klum, J.C. O'Hare, F.P. Pickett, Herman, Herman Rich, Raymond Rich, E.F. Rowler, is that how you say that? Ruler. Ruler. C.R. Stam, Hal Reed, Walter Redman, Otis Watson, and Otto Deming. 
Okay, and I know that the price is no auto deming personally uh, from from a acquaintance or friendship from the past. So if you look at that list, I mean, thus far those are the sort of the the heavyweights, if you will, in this teaching that's emerging. You've got Bultum on that list. We've talked about him. You got O'Hare. We spent a ton of time talking about him. Baker Stam is on that list. Uh, some of the other men there also had, uh, you know, pretty significant local church ministries. Uh, Hal Reed, uh, as well as both of uh, the, the riches there, um, Herman and his son Raymond were very much also involved in the ministry. So these are the men that are present in this in, in this weekend meeting that's going on uh, in September 1944. Pastor Herman Rich proposed that a new fellowship organization of pastors and Christian workers be formed which would adopt the doctrinal platform of the Worldwide Grace Testimony and have as its object to provide a fellowship among those who believe in the truths contained in the doctrinal statement and to promote the gospel of the grace of God throughout this land and the world. The thing I want you to see, folks, is that the formation of the GGF as an organized entity is stemming out of the formation of the Worldwide Grace Testimony in 1939. Okay? And the, the proposal to form the fellowship is directly related. These guys in the GGF are going to adopt the Worldwide Grace Testimony platform as far as their doctrinal statement. So the GGF is going to, the, the GGF is coming out of this action up here in January 1939. These two things are related. This happens first, the Worldwide Grace Testimony, and a few years later there is going to be this proposal that is issued to have a more formalized uh, system of fellowship amongst these different brethren that were mentioned in the previous point. The proposition was adopted and the, conven and the convention elected as pro-term officers Herman Rich as president Raymond Rich as secretary and Otis Watson as treasurer. It was decided that the new organization be named Grace Gospel Fellowship and that the next convention would be held in St. Louis in May of 1945 with the host pastor E.F. Rowler of St. Louis Bible Fellowship. Okay, so the GGF not only is it first proposed, but in all technicality, it's basically formed in September 1944 with all of those men that are listed in uh, two points above being the primary men that are uh, involved in the formation and um, establishing the fellowship. So before we go any further, does anybody have any questions or comments about this? Well, basically, if they, they want to call it that or not, they just started a new denomination. We'll get into that in a little bit. Okay. I... Are they, the bottom line at this point is this, are they organizing beyond the local church now? Absolutely. They absolutely are, okay? As soon as you do that, now you're going to have a whole other set of dynamics that you didn't have when you just had the independent churches having Bible conferences, okay? Next, next month, Dave Reed's coming in from Ohio, and we're going to have a Bible conference here at the church. We're going to teach what we're going to teach. When the Bible conference is over, Dave Reed goes back to his church. We remain here. Nice to see you, Brother Reed. Glad, glad you came and taught us. Thank you very much. We benefit from it. But we remain independent what? Churches. Churches. Okay. In his memoirs, Pastor Stan recounts the pivotal and often overlooked role of Pastor Herman Rich played in the formation of the GGF. Stan states the following. By the grace of God, my traveling ministry was fruitful, but it was Pastor Herman Rich of, first, of the First Church of the Fundamentals in Evansville, Indiana, who, with his board, invited us to conduct the first National Berean Bible Conference at his church. Thus was formed the Grace Gospel Fellowship, a national organization of grace believers. Pastor Rich, show, uh, Pastor Rich somehow has received almost no due credit for this, but he was a great booster of others, and he was the one who had the faith vision to take the first step. In May now, May 9, 1945, at the GGF convention is going to be meeting now in St. Louis to adopt its constitution. So the following year now, now you're looking at May 1945, the GGF is going to adopt 
I can't talk and spell, as all of you know. They're going to adopt their constitution. So, the proposal is put forth in September 44. The proposal is approved. The organization is technically formed at their first convention in St. Louis the following May. They formally adopt the constitution of the, of the, the fellowship. Okay? So back to that point, on May 9, 1945 at the GGF convention in St. Louis, okay, they adopted the constitution. At the time of its adoption, membership in the fellowship consisted of 21 pastors, 8 Christian workers, three foreign missionaries, 19 laymen, and one seminary president. Okay? So the, that's sort of a, a general breakdown about who is involved here with the formation of the, of the GGF. Yeah? Which seminary and who? That's a great question. I've not been able to figure that out. Um, I sort of suspect and this is just, I'm not going to say that because it's total speculation, so I'd rather just not say anything. But the bottom line at this point, Ron, is I don't know who that would be referring to. None of the literature that I've been able to look at states that in it. Okay. okay. Article 2 of the Constitution stated the following regarding the purpose of the fellowship. Okay. The purpose of this organization shall be to promote a fellowship among those who believe the truths contained in the doctrinal statement and to proclaim the gospel of the grace of God in this land and through the worldwide grace testimony throughout the world. Recognizing the one true Bible church in this present age, composed of all who possess genuine faith in Christ, it is not our purpose or desire to form a denomination, Craig, or church, organization, or to carry out the functions of such, in governing or directing groups of believers. Okay? So when they adopt this constitution, they have a statement in it that says, we don't intend to be a denomination. Okay? Now, we'll have to reserve judgment on that for the time being until we go a little bit further with this lesson. But you need to understand, at least for the sake of fairness, that they did not view what they were doing here as the creation of a new denomination. Okay, they're viewing it as a fellowship organization of people that are independent believers, pastors, laymen, missionaries, what have you. Okay, that's what the second article of their constitution said. Now, you can take issue with that, and I, as we go through here, there might there may be good reasons to do that, and I'm not, I just don't want to give it all away too early, Craig. So just. Okay. <laughs> So at the first convention in May 1945, it was reported that some young people had been denied entrance into some of the larger Bible institutes because of their position on water baptism. As a result, a need was voiced for a school where the doctrines of the fellowship could be freely taught. A Bible institute committee was organized and charged with the task of starting a Bible institute program, possibly by September of that same year. The work of this committee culminated in the founding of Milwaukee Bible Institute, now Grace Bible College, in Grand Rapids, Michigan. So, another thing that's coming out of this is the need for a Bible Institute. And what, the, reason, the reason for that is a, a group of young people had applied to some of the bigger Bible Institutes and been denied entrance because of their position on water baptism. And so from very early on now, after the Constitution is adopted, these guys immediately start a process to investigate creating a Bible Institute program with the goal of possibly even starting it by September of the same year. Now you think about that. that that's quick. That's, that's like three months to figure that out and, and put it, get all the pieces moved into place and to establish a school that could launch in September of that same year. Okay, Now, the end result, and I'm, I'm working right now on an entire lesson just on that point uh, about the formation of Milwaukee Bible Institute, but you need to understand that the end result of this is going to be the establishment of Milwaukee Bible Institute. 
which eventually is going to move to Grand Rapids, Michigan and become Grace Bible College. Okay? But its original formation, the idea for the formation of the college, comes at this first GGF convention meeting in May 1945. Okay? Questions there? No? All right, let's go on to page three then. <clears throat> organizational, organizational functions and operations. <clears throat> According to Rich, for many years the GGF steered cleared of taking on any projects that might create the perception that the fellowship was functioning as a denomination. Over time, however, the decision was made that taking on some programs would not harm the independence of each local church. Two such programs included Pastor Subsidy Program and Share Builders. The Pastor Subsidy Program assisted with the payment of the pastor's salary for a time, enabling him to devote all of his time to organizing and developing Bible study groups in, into young churches, which could in time be self-supporting. So the idea behind this initiative is you take a pastor who's, who's uh, seeking to plant a church in a particular area, and through the collective resources of all the, church and the churches in the fellowship, they could support this, this uh, individual for a time while he did the necessary work of getting everything going to get this uh, local church off the ground. So that's, that's what basically the pastor subsidy program was about. The second was called Share Builders. And what this was about was they made low interest loans to groups for building or purchasing of church property. So it's important, if we're going to be fair in this, that we acknowledge the fact that these got, that early on in this, they are very cognizant and aware to try to not do anything that's going to put off the perception that they are a denomination. Okay? Over time, <clears throat> they're going to adopt some of these programs like Pastor Subsidy Program and Share Builders, which are going to obviously increase the involvement of the fellowship in these, in, in these ways. Okay? by making loans, small, low interest loans to the churches and subsidizing the salaries of some of these men as they uh, start to uh, form these assemblies, okay? Any questions there? Another function of the fellowship is the examination and licensing or ordaining men to the ministry. Candidates are carefully examined in every facet of doctrine and practical spiritual life in order to give assurance to churches that ordained men of the fellowship are capable and reliable to give evidence of a call. Okay, so who's determining who's qualified here? The group, the fellowship, the denomination. The independent local church? No. Or the fellowship? Fellowship. Okay, so we studied this way back four years ago. In the scriptures, who does Paul say should ordain? He says, he talks about ordaining elders in every what? Church. City. In every church in every city. And that it's the responsibility of the men in that local church to recognize and identify who should be in these positions of authority and who should not. There's, no, there's never anything given in the scriptures saying that it should be the responsibility of somebody over and above or outside of the local church. So one of the functions of the fellowship is to license, ordain, and so on, men for the ministry. So the idea is that if you are licensed and ordained by the GGF fellowship, then all the churches in the fellowship are recognizing that the fellowship says this person is what? <coughs> Qualified, even if they don't even know who that individual is or have had any personal contact with them. Okay? So, this is, so now we start to see things emerging. We start to see the subsidy program, the share builders, the examination and the licensing and ordaining of the, of the men for the ministry. These are all functions of a what? Local church. 
Th these are all the types of things that a denominational structure is going to do. Okay. So originally, next point, membership was open to all believers, but only ministers, missionaries, evangelists, and Bible teachers had voting privileges. Later on, this was, restriction was withdrawn, granting all members of voting age a voice in the business transactions of the fellowship. Since its inception in the 1940s, the GGF has gone through various changes to the structure of its fellowship. Not all these changes are without controversy, as the June 1961 edition of the Brian Searchlight testifies. In this edition of the magazine, Pastor Stam includes the text from a message he delivered at the October 1960 GGF Pastors Retreat regarding a proposal on the table to restructure the GGF. So the GGF was formed in basically 44-45. By 1960, there's a proposal on the table to, to restructure the fellowship. Okay? And there, uh, read the next uh, point. The Grace Gospel Fellowship has until now been an organization of believers within the Grace Movement, banded together for the propagation of Pauline truth. The truth of the one body with its one baptism. Now, however, we are being asked to consider a proposal that the GGF reorganize itself into an association of churches, organizations, and individuals. Now, you see the difference? Now we're not just going to be a fellowship of individual saints acting in our own conscience. Now we're going to be a fellowship of churches and sanctioned organizations. You see that? Now, Stam goes on in this edition of the, of the Searchlight to break down the proposal as follows. Section 1, Proposal. To reorganize the GGF from an association of pastors and laymen into an association of churches, organizations, and individuals. So that was the proposal that was on the table in 1960. All right. Section 2, Procedure. Churches and I believe that should say organizations, plural, will be invited to affiliate with the GGF and send delegates to the next convention. Everybody following this? Section 3 of the proposal organization. The membership is to be composed of all churches, organizations, and individuals subscribing to the doctrinal statement and who are in accord with its aims and purposes. The government of the GGF shall be vested in the delegates to the National Convention. Okay, so now what do we have? A denomination. We have a National Convention. We have delegates being sent. We have delegates voting on things and so forth, representing not just individuals, but now churches and what? Organizations. Organizations. Okay. It is clear from reading the article that Stam was not in favor of restructuring the GGF into an association of churches. Stam viewed this proposal as on par with the centralizing of church government and sectarianism. In the end, Stam writes, if this proposal is accepted, the GGF will have deriled, dribbled. dribbled, sorry, down into one of the sects of Christendom, and much division and heartache will be the result. Furthermore, its leaders will have exchanged the power of the Spirit in great measure for mechanical and political power, and all this without the slightest guarantee of improved organization. How much wiser and happier we of the GGF will be to remain one of the organizations within the grace movement dedicated to the propagation of the unadulterated gospel of the grace of God and the <clears throat> glorious truth of the, of the baptism of all believers into Christ and, uh, and the one body, which alone he is the head. If we obey his word in this, we, uh, he will surely give us the wisdom to improve the organization of the GGF. Now, I find all this fascinating myself on, on a few different levels. Number one, he does not perceive himself to be in, an organ, in, in a denomination. But he does perceive that if they adopt the resolution, then they would be what? A denomination. A denomination. Okay? So, and remember who, that Stam is one of the guys that's present back here. 
in, at that meeting in September 1944, when they first proposed it, they agreed to form it, and I'm, a, and I'm almost certain that he was there in May 1945 when they agreed to adopt the Constitution uh, as, as, a, um, as a group. But Stam has the perception that this proposal on the table is going to fundamentally alter the nature of the Grace Gospel Fellowship. And he does not want to have any part of it. And he says that if they adopt this, now they're going to be, uh, his specific words there, um, they'll exchange the power of the Spirit in great measure for mechanical and political power. And then he says in this next paragraph, how much wiser and happier if we of the GGF will remain one of the organizations within the Grace Movement. Now, if you read between the lines there, what is he saying? What he's saying is, if this, adopt, if this measure is adopted, we will be perceived as the organized grace movement. Okay? So, very interesting times here with respect to where things are at. But you, see what, you, you see what's going on here. It starts off being one thing. Fifteen years later, there's a proposal on the table for it to become what? Something else. Something else or something more than the original intent was. I do agree with him 100% about the politics statement that he makes, but my point would be the fact that he's even up lobbying for this implies that they're already into the politics of it. Because there are people on the table that have a proposal to alter this and Stan feels that he's got to get up and, and refute it. Yeah. So, um, is what you're saying then, in September of 1944, when they, when they formed it and proposed it, by 1960, the same personnel that were, were at that first are still in, are endorsing this one too? Some of them were. What, from what I gather, it was, there, was a, there was a split mindset within the people that were members of it, whether or not they wanted to adopt this new proposal or not. Stam speaking on the point from the point of view of those who opposed it issues that speech in October 1960 that is then printed in 61 in the searchlight. Yeah. Back on page three, how are these two programs, the pastor subsidy program and shares over the funded and then moving forward and it changes how is the program, how is the organization? It's a good question, Tom. I, I I have not gotten to the bottom of the details of how these things were funded and administered. I just know that they were doing them. Now, obviously, the funding's got to be coming from somewhere. So you figure it's probably from churches sending or making, or, or churches and or individuals making donations to, you know, the fellowship. And then the fellowship taking that money and, subs, you know, subsidizing the pastor or making the loans out to these, you know, startup local churches. So, any way you want to look at it, now you got the fellowship that's directly involved in these things, including the licensing and all the stuff of the ministers. And so, and now in 60, 61, 1960-61, there's this proposal on the table to not make it if a, a fellowship of individual believers, but a fellowship of individuals, churches, and organizations, which is, which is different, yeah. Was there a list of <clears throat> charter membership anywhere that could be compared to what happened after 1960? Um, well, I, I, have, split? I have a list in here uh, in a few minutes about current GG, officially approved GGF affiliate ministries. Okay. Okay. Opposed to the original. I don't have that. Form. I was just curious if there I was anything. But you can pretty much know that it's going to be Milwaukee Bible Institute and Worldwide Grace Testimony at a minimum because all of the, this, the Bible Institute, Bible College, and the, the, the GGF Convention Fellowship are all coming out of that first attempt to organize in January 1939. So the reason I ask that is because there's been such a change in what was taught then as opposed to what was taught now by GGF as far as their stand and their, you know, how well they're dug into the into the uh, into what they teach. Yeah, I, I, I don't. There, there are admittedly norms some holes in my understanding to, of the of the particular details of, you know, what is going on exactly when. Yeah. Okay. 
Mike, do you think it could be the, a tenure of the times? I mean, the, the IFCA and the uh, General Association of uh, Baptists uh, were doing the exact same thing. In the going, end, going, going in, on here. In my concluding point, they even had share, they got the share uh, share builders programs and everything. They still have them. I think what these guys are doing is exactly what they thought they should do, given what was going on. I don't. I don't think that they set out and say it with, with any sort of ill intent to let's go create a denomination. And I do. And I do think that they were at least for a while attempting to avoid that very thing. But my point is, once you have this organization formed, now the organization is going to have to. It's either going to go away or it's going to have to continue to sustain itself. And as that as that happens. Now you're going to enter into the politics of the, of the organization. And I don't think that O'Hare, I don't think that Baker, Stam, I don't think that any of these guys set out with forethought to create something that would end up being not a positive thing. I think they were following what the rest of fundamentalism was doing. Uh, you, mentioned, you mentioned the IFCA and, and uh, the independent Baptist churches and all these... That, Everybody in the 1930s and 40s within fundamentalism that was spinning off was, was doing these things, establishing Bible institutes, um, you know, the organizations like the IFCA. So, and by the way, most of the guys that are involved in this were a part of those things. O'Hare was in the IFCA. He was, part, he was at the first foundational meeting at Cicero Bible Church in the late 1920s, early 1930s. So... I'm not making an excuse for them. I'm just saying they're just doing what they thought they were supposed to do. Um, you, should they have possibly known better from the scriptures? Yeah, maybe. But th this is what they did, and this is what we're left with. Okay. But I, I don't think they set out to do something that they thought was a violation of the Word of God with any sort of, ha, 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 we're going to go you know, we're going to go do this thing and we don't care. And I, I don't think it was that way. Ronnie? Um, very likely they were all, all of the, the IFCA and everybody was reacting to a perceived threat or problem coming at them from the outside. Um, and I'm wondering, in, in Stam's um, thing that you quoted there from the Berean Searchlight, does he actually appeal to scripture at any point, or does he only have a sense that this is wrong? No, he he does. The thing is like fifteen pages. Okay. So I didn't I didn't quote didn't have room to quote all of it. I was just quoting enough to show you that this is a controversy and where Stan was at on that issue at the time. And by the way, Sylvia, yep. we need to change the notations. These these uh, things that are noted June 1960 should be June 1961. The speech that he's referring to was given in October 1960. It is reprinted in the searchlight in 1961. Okay, so if you need to make a note on that, you should do that. All right, any other thoughts on this? All right, so in September 1965, issue of the Brain Searchlight, Pastor Sam set pen to paper to explain what a GGF affiliated church was. So this didn't really, this didn't go away. Number one, a church that is self-governing and free from outside control. Now here's what I think happened. I think that this resolution initially was defeated. And I think it's not taken up again until about the 10 years later in the early 1970s. And I'll tell you, I'll, I'll show you why I think that as we go through here. But Stam is, the Stam is, Defining a GGF affiliated church, number one, is a church that is self-governing and free from outside control. It chooses its own name, elects its own officers, exercises its own discipline, and its own uh, owns its own property. While affiliated with the GGF, with the Grace Gospel Fellowship, it is in no way controlled by it, nor is it under the control of any church, denomination, or religious hierarchy. Second, a church whose doctrinal platform is in agreement with that of the Grace Gospel Fellowship. Third, a church which believes that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable, 
but also recognizes the importance of rightly dividing the word of truth. And four, a church which recognizes the distinctive character of the revelation committed to Paul as the apostle of this present dispensation and views all scripture in the light of Pauline truth. That's what he is saying a GGF affiliated church is in 1965. So if you go to page five now, top of the page, Ray Rich reports that in 1970, sweeping changes in the administration of the fellowship were approved. Okay? So that's my rationale for thinking that this first wave at restructuring didn't, what, didn't really go over very well, and a second attempt is going to happen in the 70s. And I should just say now, just for the, for the point of fact, Stam leaves the GGF in 1968. Okay? So if Stam was an outspoken, influential voice against this reorganization in the 60s, by 1970, Stam is no longer a part of the GGF. And I will have more to say about that when we get to the 1960s. Okay? So this is what uh, Ray Rich says about it. A full-time executive president, Charles O'Connor, was employed to direct promotion and development. Now watch this. The United States was divided into 12 regions, each of which, each of which has been organized with its own officers. A national cabinet composed of an elected pastor and a layman from each of the 12 regions serves as the executive committee with the president of the fellowship. They are responsible for the administration of all functions of the national organization, including the promotion and dissemination of dispensational truth. Churches may vote to become affiliated GGF churches. Delegates from affiliated churches and approved, or and approved organizations conduct the business and establish policy at the national conventions. The chief concern of the fellowship is the planting of new churches, which will result in an enlarging home constituency, which will produce a greater missionary outreach around the world and bring greater glory to God. Folks, this is a major restructuring. Okay? Now the country is divided up into 12 regions. You're going to have an executive board. You're going to have a full-time president. That th This is... I, I fail to see, and I know there are people, I know people personally that I'm friends with that are in the GGF that will fight you tooth and nail if you say that it's a denomination. They will. They don't want to, they don't want to be viewed as a denomination. My point is simply, if you look at the structure and the activities that, the, that they're involved in, I don't see how you can't think that that's what's going on here. Okay. Currently, according to the GGF website, the fellowship is structured similarly to the sweeping changes that occurred in 1970. As of September 2013, the GGF website states the following regarding their organization. Quote, when our Constitution was revised in the early 1970s, so there again, that would say that it was the 70s that these changes were made, the country was divided into 12 regions. And, uh, after a short time, Regions 3 and 4 merged to become Region 3. In 1995, Regions 5 and 6 asked to be merged as Region 5. So there are 10 regions at this present time. Each region has a council comprised of all active pastors, plus lay representatives from, uh, for each affiliate church, affiliated church and some representing the individual members of the GGF who are not in an affiliated church. The proportion of representation is established by our Constitution. Each region selects one pastor and one layman to represent them on the National Council. The National Council serves as the governing board for the fellowship. The National Council selects someone to serve as president of the fellowship. The president acts for the council in all the daily or uh, daily operations. He is responsible for the operation of our office and all its procedures. Now, look, it's hard for me to not read this stuff and think this is a denomination. Now, if any, does anybody disagree with that? No. Sounds like a Monty Python skit. You are a denomination. You are not a denomination. <laughs> <laughs> In addition, the GGF lists the following, quote, affiliated ministries. Mm -hmm. Please note that all these ministries are specifically offset on the GGF webpage from Grace Sites. 
thereby indicating that they have been approved or sanctioned by the fellowship. Okay? If you go to their webpage and you look, don't take my word for it, you go look for yourself. And you click on it at organizations or something, it'll drop down, it'll say affiliated organizations. And then underneath that it'll say grace sites. So they're clearly making a distinction and a delineation between a grace site and an affiliated organization. And I, I've listed out here for you who their affiliated organizations are. Some of these I've never heard of, some of them I have. Believers Express Service, I don't know what that is. Uh, and frankly, I didn't spend a lot of time trying to find out. Grace Adventures, this was formerly known as Grace Youth Camp. Grace Bible College. Grace Ministries International, Grace Mission Philippines, Grace Publications, Ministry Coaching MD, Prison Mission Association, Salt Ministries, San German Ministries, St. Louis Theological Seminary, TBS Ministries, and Things to Come Mission. These are all affiliated or approved organizations of the GGF. Okay? Alright, before we get to my concluding thoughts here, does anybody have any questions, comments, or observations about any of this? Fred? It's definitely very politically structured, even if they don't want to call it a denomination. Look at these organizations. Let's, just, just look at what we have here. Look at the uh, bottom of page 5. Grace Bible College, title page 6, Grace Ministries International, Grace Publications. Let's just stop with those three. What do you have there? You have a Bible Training Institute, you have a publishing house, and you have a mission board. So, so you, have a, you, have a, you have a national convention that sanctions a publishing house, a Bible college and a mission board. If if you were to look at the the the, the, the structure of any other denomination, do they have Bible colleges, publishing houses, and mission boards? So in functionality, are they doing all of the same things that any other mainline or, or any other denomination would be doing? Yeah. Except for no seminary. Well, apparently Dallas or St. Louis Theological Seminary oh. is listed. Oh, right. So I, I don't know. I don't really know too much about that particular school. Um, okay. There's a as of right now, there's a five-year uh, what's called a Bachelor of Theology that uh, Grace Bible College offers, oh. and the if you go through that course of study, at the end you have an internship and then you have a hearing before the GGF board for licensing and ordination. Do, do and they you, actually endo, uh, um, ordain the people? Yeah. They, li they, they, rec they, they have an oral, they have a, I, mm -hmm. there's an oral uh, review that they have to go to and stand before a panel of pastors that, are, uh, that ask them oral questions regarding theology and scripture, and if they pass these examination and licensing tests, then the, the the GGF will license and ordain them as a, as into the ministry. Yeah. I can, in the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, um, people who complete seminary are put on a list of recommendations, but nobody ordains but a local church. Now, for 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 fairness, um, you might run into situations within the GGF where a local church would feel that they would want to do that. But I know that the that the the college, if the college licenses the graduate, then the idea behind that is then they are fit and qualified to lead any GGF affiliated church. Yeah. The St. Louis uh, Theological Seminary, a lot of their courses are actually online. So you have men from all over the United States that can actually get involved in that program. Probably the same with Grace Bible College. I knew they do some online, but mm -hmm. I think a lot, a good bit of uh, St. Louis's are online. But they do have graduating classes because they order um, 
they order some stuff from us for their graduates. So, um, so I'm assuming that they do their own ordination. Ordination. Could be, but I I, I do know that the GGF is doing this type of licensing. So. You know, I should probably, for the sake of fairness, tell all of you, I think most of you are aware of the fact that I went to Grace Bible College, okay? I, I have a two, I have a, a associate's degree in business administration from them and a bachelor of religious education degree, which is basically the theological major without the Greek and all the other, and a few preaching courses. But all of the, all of theology and Bible and all that classes I had to take to graduate. So when I'm sort of talking about some of these things, I'm not speaking about them from the point of view of complete ignorance and not having actually been there myself. And there are other, other brethren here in this assembly that have also been students there uh, at given times. Um, so it's not my, I know this is coming across as negative towards all this. And if I'm being honest with you, I probably am somewhat negative about it because I don't agree and I think all of you know this, I don't agree with this type of organization above the local church. I don't see it in Scripture, and I don't find it to be the scriptural pattern that should be being followed. So let's, I'll give you my concluding thoughts on this. The GGF, as it is presently constructed, bears all the markings of a denomination. They have their own fellowship association, national council, Bible college, mission board, and publishing house. While some within the fellowship might take issue with this classification, there are some who would concede the point. Okay? I've run in, I know people in the GGF who will argue tooth and nail that it's not a denomination, and I have no other people that will concede, yeah, it is. It is my, pers it is my personal, private, subjective opinion <clears throat> that organizing at a level beyond the local church is a mistake. Paul never established anything beyond local churches. While Pauline churches of the first century may have cooperated with each other loosely, they did not bear the type of organized structure that the GGF currently manifests. Organizing beyond the local church brings politics into the equation, and as the history of the grace movement will bear out over the rest of this class. Um, some of the worst fighting has been between the people that are in these organizations. Because once you form the organization, now you have a power structure. And the people that are going to the people that are going to control that structure are going to be the ones that are able to influence what's happening below it. All right? And so I think this entire thing in my opinion was a mistake. I uh, look at the next point. The men who founded the fellowship in the 1940s did what they thought was right. In fact, they were doing what the rest of fundamentalism was doing at the time, formally organizing beyond the local church. It is my opinion that they should have remained a loose fellowship of independent churches as they were during the 1930s. I think they would have been more well suited if they just would have remained local independent Bible churches that, had, that met together for Bible conferences, did some things, whatever, but as soon as they enter into a structure, a formalized structure beyond it, I think that is where the mistake was made. Once the movement institutionalized, and political bickering and inf let me start that sentence over. Once the movement institutionalized and political bickering and infighting over doctrine began to take hold, the movement stagnated and fractured. As yet, the grace movement as a whole has yet to regain its former vitality and energy. Yes, I am submitting to you that when this happened, you remember when we started this class and we talked about a man with a message and a movement, and eventually they establish a monument, and the monument becomes a morgue. Remember that? When this happens, and now it becomes about authority or control of the organization. This thing that had so much life and energy in, in, the, in the early days of the 30s and so forth, it, it just, it, it almost, you know, people want to know, people ask all the time, what happened to this, what happened that there, you don't see the, the same type of, I think that the thing fell apart from within. Because the different groups split, they fractured, they went off, 
and then they start throwing stones at each other. Okay, and that that's and I'm telling you that's just a fact. And I'll you know we'll talk about those things as we go through the rest of this. So I'm going to read that statement again. Once the movement institutionalized and political bickering and infighting over doctrine began to take hold, the movement stagnated and fractured. As yet, the grace movement as a whole has yet to regain its former vitality and energy. It is to thriving independent churches that we must look to in the present as well as in the future if we are going to seek to recapture the heyday of O'Hare. That's my opinion. For you folks watching this and listening, that's my opinion. You're certainly free to disagree with me if you want to. But that's a basic history uh, from some of the sources and documents as well as my personal commentary on a few of those items. Yeah, like, <clears throat> What was the infighting over the doctrine? I thought the doctrine was pretty stable and secure at this time. They changed the doctrine? I mean, they all began... Um, you know how it is. You get you get preachers together and they don't agree about everything, right? And now you get them together in a, in a, in a national convention setting, and other things are going to happen here. It's not just that. There are other factors that we haven't gotten to yet that are going to play into this. But eventually, yeah, they, yeah, structurally. How does the GGF compare with the IFCA? Well, I'm not a... Admittedly, Mike, I don't know everything about the IFCA. But that's more loose, isn't it, as far as... It's uh, definitely not a denomination, and uh, it's a more loose organization. Uh, you, uh, I'm not going to comment because I just don't know enough about it. I know, but what, what, again, O'Hare and possibly some of the other brethren that are involved in the formation of this were a part of or affiliated or associated with the IFCA movement at the in the late 20s and early 30s okay I mean O'Hare was was big into that when uh, O'Hare even writes a letter to the IFCA explaining his um, areas of disagreement with them so Yeah, Fred. I think I think within within the IFCA there is this mindset by local churches, hey, we're independent. Yeah, you know, but yet they have the organization, and uh, they have Bible institutes and approved organizations and so forth. So and I think that if, very similar. If you were to ask. If you were to ask an individual GGF affiliated church, I think they would say the same thing. I think they would say, "No, we're independent. They don't. They don't tell us how to, you know, run the things in our assembly." Okay, and maybe they don't on a daily basis. My fundamental observation here is that, however you want to, however you want to dissect this, you still now have something that is established that is over and above what and these churches are sending delegates to that represent them to a national body yeah. I don't see you can you can play semantics if you want but that is still if I'm making cookies that's all the ingredients of a denomination I think the JRBC is is more structurally you know more controlling over their churches and so forth than either one of the IFC or the UGF. But, um, you know, a lot of these pastors, you know, especially the older ones, came out of denominations that were, were real controlling. They owned property, they, you know, like the one in Muskegon there, they, they ended up, uh, the denomination kept the property and people had to, you know, they'll start their own uh, building program and so forth over again. And that's one thing I don't think any, not any of these organizations have gone into where, of owning property and stuff that the local church is meeting in, but that's about the only, <laughs> you know, about the only thing they've fallen short on. 
So just to be clear, I I don't want I don't hate the GGF, okay? But I also I also don't think that they've helped things out in the long run, okay? And I think that comparatively speaking, their current stance on paper their stance is good. The problem I see is that what they say they're for on paper, I don't see publicly preached with authority and conviction from, from the pulpits of the assemblies the way it would have been when O'Hare was involved in this. Okay? Um, it's just, I've, I've been in enough of the assemblies, I've, I've, I've seen enough things personally to, to, to know that the... I'll, I'll, I'll sum, I summarize it this way to my dad, and I'll, I'll say it to you in conclusion. As I look at the, the as I look at the GGF now as an outside observer, the biggest issue that I see with it is I don't, and I'm gonna say it this way, and hopefully this will make sense to you. I don't see the spirit of O'Hare in the thing. I don't see it. I don't see the passionate conviction of principle to stand for and to preach what they say on paper they believe. Okay? And that's just, some of you are shaking your head, you've been involved in, in some of those assemblies here in the area, and you know, there's good safe people in there. There are good safe people in those churches, there are people that understand mid ex Pauline dispensationalism in those churches. But as a, as a rule, it is, not the, it is not the main reason why, it, 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 it's not a motivating force for why those assemblies are doing what they're doing. Um, and it's almost a perception that that's something that you talk about on Wednesday night because you can't talk about that Sunday morning because you'll turn people off. My attitude is exactly the opposite. Okay, My attitude is this is what Paul says to preach. He says to preach the word be instant in season, not a season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and what? Doctrine. So if, if we're not going to stand for a doctrine, if we're not going to preach what we say we believe, then we might as well go be like every other church, you know, up and down the street. And I've probably said too much, and like I said, there's going to be people that start watching these lessons as we get closer to the future that are going to take exception to some of the, to some of the viewpoints that I have about these things. And it's not my intention to take my mind and cram it down your throat, okay? So you're free to disagree with me about any of this stuff if you want to. Okay? Anything else? Right. So yeah. at, at the college, they, you know, if I went to that college as a younger man and didn't, and didn't understand the mystery and, and went to that college, what are the chances of me ever really getting it? I mean, by them, by them churches teaching. When I when I was there, you had to take two classes in dispensational theology. Okay. So you will be exposed to dispensational theology through the coursework that you have. But again, it's, it's sort of in a lot of ways not, it's not stressed. It's not, it's not, it's not, you don't get the sense that it's important. It's just this thing that we do because we say we believe. Now, and again, I can't speak for every individual, and I don't, I don't want to paint with that big of a brush. And it might be different now than it was when I was there well, 12 years ago now. Okay. Well, we got to quit, or uh, we won't get in church in time. Do you have any other